If you've been alive for more than about 15 minutes, you've heard of the acronym GMO, and a lot of times it's associated with fear and fueled by ignorance. If you make it through this video, you may still be fearful, but you won't be ignorant. A lot of times your favorite snacks will say something like this just below the scientific literature, aka the nutritional label. I'm about to unveil some facts about GMOs and my opinions on the matter from hours of research and life-changing discoveries I've made over the past couple of weeks that have changed my outlook on food forever. GMO stands for genetically modified organisms and that can pertain to plants, animals, or microbes that have had their DNA altered through genetic engineering. In this video, we will focus on plants. A common misconception is that hybrid vegetables and GMO vegetables are the same things, but this is not the case. You can make hybrid vegetables at your house through cross-pollination, just like you can cross two breeds of chickens and make a hybrid chicken. But unless you have a lab in your basement and can splice DNA at a cellular level, you cannot make GMO vegetables at your house. When a GMO plant is made, the DNA from at least two different plants are spliced together in the cell and grown in tissue culture into a plant. And the fruit of that plant is harvested and then replanted on a larger scale to make the GMO crop. Did you catch that? In most cases, GMO vegetables do grow true to seed, just like the open pollinated heirloom vegetables do. And that begs the question, why are we even doing this? Let's take the largest commercial crop in the United States as our example, field corn. Over 90% of the field corn commercially grown in the US is GMO, and it ends up in food products that we eat regularly, like Little Debbie's that I showed at the beginning of this video. The intended benefits of the GMO corn crop are as follows, and these are facts, they're not my opinion. Number one is improved taste and nutrition. Supposedly, by altering the DNA of a certain organism, they can bring out the best traits from each variety and modify a new species at a cellular level, and therefore produce a superfood that surpasses all non-altered varieties in taste and nutrition. But that's not all. They are also insect and herbicide resistant. The most common commercially grown field corn in the U.S. has traits like Bt and Ht. Let's unpack that briefly. The Bt trait means that the corn plant produces a protein known as Bt delta endotoxin, which is essentially a stomach poison that kills certain types of insects that eat it, but is said to be harmless to humans. And the HT trait stands for herbicide tolerant, which means that the plant that is producing your food can be sprayed about with herbicides and not die. Yes, that is most commonly glyphosate. GMO plants are faster growing, which means they can increase crop yields and reduce the overall cost to produce. When you start taking the clothes off of a situation, you can see the money trail a whole lot easier. Some of the possible dangers that I see are as follows. These are my opinions. Remember that protein that kills insects from the Bt trait? The Bt delta endotoxin is made up mainly of the three amino acids, arginine, tryptophan, and cysteine, of course chained together by peptide bonds. Now to keep this short, the only essential amino acid in that list for humans is tryptophan, which is needed for the synthesis of serotonin you know, the mood and sleep regulator. Arginine is considered semi-essential, meaning you can get it from food, but your body can make it without you ingesting it. Cysteine is considered non-essential. But fun fact, if you eat eggs like we all do, you're getting plenty arginine and cysteine. It always seems like when we come up with something like this to combat nature, nature comes back with a vengeance. For example, everybody's heard of the bacterial infection staph, staph infection. Somewhere around 1960, we came up with an antibiotic known as methicillin to combat that. And it didn't take long for methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aurea to arise. Now we have to come up with something different to treat it. Bactrim, clindamycin, doxycycline, so on and so on. I said that to say this. What happens when an insect comes along that is not affected by the Bt Delta endotoxin. By genetically engineering these plants, are we subsequently engineering super insects? That's my first heavily uneducated opinion on the possible dangers of GMO vegetables. But the next point is really the one that makes me wiggle. Many of the most common foods that we eat contain corn, like high fructose corn syrup, which is in everything, corn starch, grits, hominy, cornmeal, 
corn oil, corn chips, corn tortillas, and the list goes on and on forever. How does it make you feel to know that the plant that grew the corn that's in your food was being sprayed with herbicides throughout its life because it can genetically handle it? And as far as improving the taste, my goodness, are we adults or are we children? Does everything we eat have to taste like candy? The best thing I ever did for my personal health was to start eating food solely for the fuel rather than for what it tasted like. Now, I get some sideways looks from some of my old buddies that I hadn't seen in a couple of years because I've lost roughly 50 pounds over that period of time. They kind of comment and say, man, you look kind of sick. You look malnourished. What's wrong with you? And I reply by saying, no, we live in the South and you haven't ever seen anything but fat people. You don't know what a healthy person looks like. Anyway, my opinion on the personal health implications of GMO foods. I'm not fully convinced either way, but right now, I'm not a fan of them. We may be living in a new age, we may have new technology, but your body is an ancient organism. And in my opinion, it does not need newfangled food to survive and thrive. In the whole scheme of things, GMO foods are relatively new. Do I think GMOs is going to kill you? Probably not. Are GMO plants optimized for your health and nutrition or the pocketbooks of some? You're going to have to decide that for yourself. As for me, I raised the old tried and true open pollinated heirloom vegetables to sell and to eat. I have heirloom non-GMO seed kits linked below in the description if you want to shop around. From a self-sufficient standpoint, heirloom is the only way to go. I know hybrid vegetables are fun to grow. They're fun to eat. But if your garden is full of hybrid vegetables, you're not self-sufficient. You're only self-sufficient until you need to plant next year's garden because hybrid vegetables do not grow true to seed. They often revert back to one of the parent plants they were crossed with. Like that hybrid cucumber seed I planted a couple of years ago, it grew what looked to be a watermelon vine with baby watermelons on it. The fruit was about as big as a golf ball and it never got any bigger and it was just full of seeds. I don't know exactly what it was, but I know it was a waste of time and effort. That's gonna just about do it. I'm honored that this channel has gained some traction over the past couple of weeks, and I am dedicated to providing you with no-nonsense content that is beneficial for your viewing pleasure. Until next time, God bless.